Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Magnus, and I'm going to talk to you guys about the basics of search engine optimization. Now, I do want to give a disclaimer that this is a presentation that I developed for um, communication students to kind of understand the basics of search engine optimization and how it works in application to uh, what they're doing. So I offer that context because uh, some of the things are going to be a little bit simplified. Um, this is not the end all be all guide to SEO. This is very much um, how do we understand the basics of what goes into this idea of SEO um, and what do we do with it? Well, first things first, let's understand what is search engine optimization. Um, so when you hear people talk about SEO, it's a, it's a buzzword right now, but because it's a very important skill uh, in the modern digital workplace. SEO is the abbreviation for search engine optimization, which is the practice of increasing the quantity and quality of traffic to your website or product through organic search. Um, simplified, that's really just how Google finds the things that you're writing. And this is really important for uh, communication students at all levels. So if you're in advertising, maybe you're writing a uh, copy for a website, you want Google to be able to find the things you're writing to sell a product or whatever it may be. And PR, if you're writing, uh, you know, press releases, you want them to be found so people will cover that story. If you're in journalism, you know, uh, your breaking news uh, is, is on the front page of the website for a few hours, but then how do people find it beyond that? And a lot of those answers uh, exist within this idea of search engine optimization, just being a little bit intentional about the way you write things uh, with an understanding of who your audience is and how they look for things. It, it really is uh, about understanding audience, much like many of the other things that we do in communication. Another common question is where, where do we do searches? And the answer is literally everywhere. We search for things on when we're looking for something to watch, when we're looking for something on Amazon, when we're searching for somebody's name on social media, uh, when we're looking for something on MapQuest or Google Maps or YouTube. Um, you know, I, I even do searches constantly when I'm trying to remember who sent me an email to search by their name or a keyword or try to find a document on my computer based around what was the topic of that, right? We search constantly. And so the top, the, the things that we're going to talk about today apply to most of these things broadly, but we're really focusing on Google as a search engine and uh, how people search for things in this kind of traditional search context. Now, that being said, why is SEO important? Well, 93 to 94% of all online experiences start with a search engine at, the, at this point. And if you think about it, like even if you use the Google Chrome browser, um, if you go up to the URL bar, it does a search. It, it doesn't even take you directly to the page. It takes you to a Google search of that URL because it wants to make sure that you're finding the thing that you're intending to find. Uh, well, this is a useful insight for us in advertising and PR and communication in general because that helps us uh, be more intentional about being the thing that people find. So while paid advertising and social media and other online platforms can generate traffic, the majority of it's driven by search engines. And we do have ads at the top of that and those are always kind of evolving. Uh, Google's always trying to figure out how to get people to click on those more, but statistically, uh, roughly 10 people, 10% 10 of people click on paid search advertisements, which if you think about how many searches there are a day, that's still a lot. But that also means that 90% of people who are searching look for those organic results, is what we call them, the, the things that come up below the ads. And those that's an earned placement. People are very intentional about trying to be listed in that spot, and you can be too. So these are some estimated numbers. This is, uh, these are a little dated, but it still gives us some context and this ties together with some of the other things that we're gonna look at in the rest of this presentation. But um, if you look at where people click on a page when they do a search, roughly a third of them click on the first organic link, the first thing that shows up. Uh, 
when they reach number two, it's about 18%, still a pretty solid number of people, but a pretty sharp decline from number one. Uh, number three is 11%, four, eight percent, and it just declines from there. If you go past page one, uh, basically the rest of all pages share about 9%. Um, so everything from the second page to, you know, the 15 millionth result, all of that as a clump shares 9%. So uh, it's important to be on the first page when you can, where you can, because you're gonna get a decent amount of traffic from that potentially. Now this is becoming even more relevant with voice search uh, because it doesn't give you options to say, which of these top three things do you wanna choose? It pretty specifically chooses the top one um, or would the one that's formatted the best for voice chat. And that's not voice search. And that's really not the topic of today, but um, it is relevant to note that that number one spot is going to be increasingly important for businesses um, which it means it's increasingly important for us to understand how to help and support businesses stay at that spot. So uh, I'm going to show some different charts and graphs from various websites that there's a lot of information out there on this, but SEO Clarity offered some research uh, to show those numbers a little bit more visually, specifically with the difference between um, desktop versus mobile. You can see that those numbers are even slightly different there. Um, and that's for overall search, but the, the predominantly the curve looks a little bit like this for those of you that are more visually oriented. And this is uh, from uh, a Moz training. Um, and I'll discuss that a little bit here in a bit. But as you can see, um, this is just the visual representation of the information we were just discussing, which is going to become pretty important later in the presentation, because we tie back to this a little bit and understanding how all this works. So what impacts SEO? There are like 200 different factors, if not more, that um, impact how something ranks. And it is uh, over, like content and backlinks and security and page speed and mobile friendliness, domain age, and all kinds of things. And this can seem overwhelming. And for a lot of people, this is why SEO as a topic seems like it's more for IT people, more for web developers, more for, um, you know, uh, less for communicators and more for people in the tech space. But I'm here to tell you two of the most important pieces are content and backlinks. And content is um, very much a communicator's uh, role, is, is the writing of the things on the page. And backlinks we'll get into a little bit, but um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a, a digital evolution of PR. Um, and so we'll look at those and understand those and kind of see how those impact SEO uh, as we go forward. So really today at, at a high level, we're just going to be covering keyword research. How do you find it? What do you do with it once you have it? Um, and link building as a kind of an introductory topic. There's a lot that goes into link building, but we're just scratching the surface to understand. Now I'm going to be sharing some, um, some spreadsheets that uh, for context so that everybody can understand where this information comes from. And all of this stuff that I'm using today uh, was pulled from Moz. Now this is not, uh, I'm not an ambassador for Moz or anything. I just think that it is pretty intuitive for someone getting started. Um, and for uh, any universities who want to use this in the context of education, they also offer a 75% discount for nonprofits, which most universities uh, qualify for that. So it's a great learning tool for students who want to learn the basics of SEO. Um, once It doesn't do everything that professionals may need. So uh, once you get past this, you may get into exploring HREFs or SEMrush or some others. But know that uh, for the context of this presentation, when I show some data sets, um, this is specifically where they came from. Now, if you want to use a free software that does something similar, uh, Google has Google Keyword Planner, and Google Keyword Planner um, will give you a lot of insights that are parallel to what we're looking at, but they're not quite as in-depth. It's pretty broad, but it's still, if, if you don't have a paid tool, it's something that you can use similarly to get some insights on understanding how people are searching for the things they're searching for. So 
the first thing that we have to understand in keyword research is we have to understand people. People are at the center of everything that we do in communication, and this is no different. Um, and so for this particular example, we're going to go through uh, someone looking for a milks alternative. So most people, when they search for things, they search, they ask questions in their head and then uh, search for the, the shortest version of that question. So for instance, if someone were going to uh, search, what is the best milk substitute? They might just search milk substitute. Um, alternatively, somebody might search substitute for milk, milk alternatives, all kinds of different things. Now we are gonna look at Excel a little bit today as kind of like scratching the surface of this idea of data mining, um, but nothing too scary. As you can see, we have two columns of information here and it's pretty simple. What this is saying is that on um, a monthly average in the United States, on average, how many people are searching for this particular phrase? And it's a pretty broad number, uh, but we can see that milk substitute is getting uh, over 11,000 and under 30,000 searches per month in the US. And so that's pretty good, that's good to know. Uh, and similarly, best non-dairy milk, still getting some traction, things like that. And when you pull these spreadsheets, you may get thousands of different keyword alternatives. So it's important to be able to really understand what's um, important and choose things that have uh, the appropriate amount of search volume. And we'll look at that as well. So when we write, we have a message in mind. And so um, I collaborated in one of my classes last semester with a brand called Mwala, uh, which is a um, non-dairy alternative. And so I'm gonna share a little bit of the insights from well, what we learned in the context of that class in this presentation. But Mwala at the time uh, was going through a revamping of some of their products, reformulating them with more nutrients. And so the narrative there was our products were recently reformulated to have more potassium and calcium, replacing the nutrients missing in most non-dairy alternatives while being a great option for people with allergies. Now that's a, that's a great message, it's a great message, but when we look at that, is there anything in there that someone would search for to find this particular phrase? Um, you know, you look at that and you say, maybe non-dairy alternatives, but for the most part, it's a well-written, meaningful sentence, but it doesn't have a lot of keywords in it. So can we rewrite that exact same statement with more phrases that people are searching for relevant to our product? Well, absolutely. Um, so an alternative version might say, Moala's new banana milk and oat milk now contain more essential nutrients, offering great tasting milk substitutes that are free of top eight allergens. Okay, well that's still well written, actually maybe even better written than the previous statement. Uh, but here's the thing that's really important about it is it has a lot of keywords in there. It has the brand, it has two of their top products, it has essential nutrients, milk substitutes, and top eight allergens. These are all key phrases that we would want to rank for with this particular product. Now, did I change the story at all? No, not really, right? We're saying the exact same thing, uh, but at the end of the day, is it something that is more search friendly to say that same thing? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And let's look at that by the numbers a little bit. Um, these at the time that uh, did this initial research, um, this is the minimum and maximum monthly volume that people were searching for the phrases that were there. Um, and so the difference between that first statement, which didn't have any of our keywords in it, to this second statement that has quite a few in there um, is the difference between like over 100,000 to 200,000 potential visitors per month. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer, in reality, we probably wouldn't try to put that many keywords in one statement. It's called keyword stuffing. Um, it can be penalized if you, um, if you do it too much. And so uh, this is more for an exaggerated version of this particular um, demonstration so that we can understand the context. But um, as you can see here, with going back to those numbers, uh, if we take that total search volume and in theory, everybody who searched also clicked 
And if they clicked, um, they clicked on a non-advertisement in theory. What was in first position, if it ranked number one for all of those things, could get 35,000 to 65,000 clicks. Third position could get 12,000 to 23,000. And 10th position, still being on the first page of Google for all of those phrases, but being 10th version versus first is gonna get you only 2,000, between 2,500 and, and 5,000 visitors a month, which still is not bad, right? That's still great traffic, but if I got the option to choose, do I want 2,500 visitors or do I want 65,000 visitors, I'm probably gonna choose that larger number if it's qualified traffic, right? So um, again, all we did was we strategically wrote around keywords. Now. Um, what about non-dairy alternatives as a keyword? Well, as you can see here, um, it's a clever sounding phrase, but it's not the way that we talk in our heads. It might be something that we say at dinner or with friends or something, because uh, it's a, a fancy sounding phrase, but when I'm just asking questions in my head, I'm probably not looking for non-dairy alternatives as a phrase. What that NA means is that there's not even enough search volume for that particular variation of the phrase. Um, for them to even give you an estimate of what it could be. Like somebody searched for it at some point, but there's not a monthly search volume. So not the choice I would probably make. And does milk substitute sound as articulate and intelligent as non-dairy alternatives? I mean, not really, like I get that, but we also have to think, um, how are people going to discover this information and how do we, um, make educated decisions and how we write things to to reach people appropriately all right how do we action this i don't know about you guys but when i was a kid i love doing mad libs i still who am i kidding i still love doing mad libs it's a lot of fun uh, when they're on the back of a cereal box for you know my kids uh, they never get to do it because i always do it i'm that dad um but the thing about how do we action this well there's two different ways that we could potentially do that. Um, one is that you can uh, write something first and then edit around it. Or what I really like to do is sometimes I'll do reverse Mad Libs or some combination of the two where I'll say, okay, here are the five keywords that I'm going to try to really uh, make sure that are on this product description. And with that, um, maybe I write the product description first and then I figure out how to work those in or maybe I start by writing with these keywords in context so I can you know, write around them. But that's more or less the way that we do this. We find the words that make the most sense to choose um, and then strategically build around them. So where do we put keywords? Uh, well, there are a lot of different places to put keywords, and this is a hot topic of debate for some SEOs, but uh, I'm going to tell you a fairly simplified version of my opinion of some of the useful places to put these. Um, number one is in the web URL. You can see there, um, you know, website name.com backslash learn SEO. Well, that's a pretty, if that's the, the top ranking piece of information about that page, it's probably a useful place to put that information. Too many people, when they have URLs, it, it's just, it's really long and it doesn't necessarily have the right information in it. Um, if you can kind of describe that page in two to three words uh, separated by a hyphen, that's really useful for SEO because uh, it helps teach search engines what that page is about. Another place that it uh, kind of indexes this information is something called a hover, tab hover card. Um, it's called several different things, but we all know it as the thing at the top of the page that we never really pay attention to. Well, that being said, a lot of brands try to write something really clever in that space, or they try to have some kind of fun statement, but the reality of it is we never really spend a lot of time just looking at that. We don't spend a lot of time going to read those. And so do they need to be coherent? Yeah, absolutely. But is that a place that we can put some of our keywords? Yeah, that's also a place that we could potentially integrate some of those keywords usefully. Uh, titles of articles are a great place to put them. And then we start to get into a little bit more of the technical coding thing, but follow me. This is really more simple than it looks. Um, number one is the SEO Essential Starter Kit. 
right here you see that there's like a main tag. Now, typically we have one H1 tag, um, which again, follow me, I'll explain where to put this, is much easier than it sounds. Um, we have one which is one of the main ideas. Um, you could have others, but even just from like a visual point of view, it makes it a little bit more challenging to read when there's a uh, uh, convoluted hierarchy of information. Uh, an H2 tag is going to be any of those headings for different sections. H3 might be uh, a main point broken down into something, and then we have just our regular paragraph verbs, uh, words. Now, some people may debate whether this uh, Google prioritizes things in this order. Google has actually said, we don't, we used to care about that, but we don't so much anymore. I think that's hard to believe, but also I guarantee you that it still helps, and I'll tell you why. One of the things that Google does care about is how much time somebody spends on a page. It is an indicator to Google of um, how good the content is and whether other people should potentially read it or not. Well, that being said, if you break things down in a way that is easy for people to read and follow, they're going to spend more time on the page reading the article and subsequently help your search rankings. So. I think fundamentally it's a smart choice. I think from a reader perspective, you want to do those things as well. Uh, but know that it this is kind of a little bit of a coding piece. But this little coding piece is very easy. If you've ever had access to the back end of a website, even a blog, you've probably seen this tiny little A with an arrow by it. And that is uh, where you choose heading one, heading two, heading three, heading, you know, all those different things. And so uh, everything that I just showed you right here, you just highlight it and then change it with this particular tab. So that, that, that's the entirety of the coding that you're doing and doing this. They make it very intuitive. Um, if you were like me, you have probably learned um, how to write on Microsoft Word. And so forever when you've been writing articles and you want something to be a heading, you just make it bolder and two points high, like larger, right? That's just kind of what we're, we do in Microsoft Word. And so that's what we typically tend to do when we get into writing things for web. But know that um, this exists as a way to make that faster, but also as a way to um, kind of indirectly do some of the coding to the page that helps people find stuff. So if you pick up nothing else from today, uh, know that that is a very important piece. That little A with an arrow that you may have never paid attention to before is a very, very important piece of search engine optimization when it comes to teaching Google and readers what your website or web page is about. All right. Something that Google does not read is something called the meta description. A lot of the time you'll have the opportunity to, to rewrite the meta description, um, but do you know who does read the meta description? Humans. So it's really important to still pay attention to how we write the meta descriptions of our pages. Uh, we want to make sure that if somebody finds two, three, four different options to choose from, ours is the one that makes the most logical sense to click because it's written in a way that makes sense. Now I have several, uh, you know, here and the titles are obviously written in very enticing ways and that is an SEO factor, right? But if we read below, um, the first one there, it, it just kind of took copy from the website and put it in the meta description. So we have these different headings that look like text in a sentence and it looks clunky and awkward to read. And if I look at that, I'm like, I, I don't understand what that's talking about versus the other two, uh, the meta descriptions are rewritten very specifically to uh, guide you through and understand what that is about in a fairly simple yet enticing way. So meta descriptions don't really directly impact uh, SEO in the fact that Google doesn't read them because, um, but it does indirectly impact SEO because it affects how many people click on your website, which click-through rate is a factor in SEO. So um, you want to write in that space, not something that's necessarily optimized for keywords. You want to write something in this particular space that's more enticing to the reader about why they should want to visit the page to see the rest of everything. 
How many p keywords should I pick? Uh, depends on the amount of competition, or is this a local page or a national page? Um, keyword relevancy, how much time you're willing to spend doing it, how much client time the client is willing to buy. Potentially hundreds or thousands for a particular website as a whole. Um, but really anything is better than nothing. If you just start with 10 for practice, um, that's a really solid number to try to start integrating and optimize for 10 different keywords on uh, a particular site. Maybe, maybe that's too many for one article when you're getting started. And maybe three to seven per page, but say the main keyword, um, ideally three times in there, because you want Google to know that that's the main focus of that particular page. Um, and again, these are uh, broad hypothetical non-scientific numbers for people to kind of get started with. There's a lot of formulas and research about best practices. That's, that's not what we're here about today. We're, we're here to just kind of conceptually start to think through how do we integrate search engine optimization into things that we're already doing uh, to amplify the efforts of our current, you know, uh, tasks. All right. Now, there is a little bit of strategy that goes into choosing keywords. Again, this is from a, a Moz training for context. Um, but we, we saw this curve earlier to understand. Uh, and most people would look at something like milk substitute, and they would say, that's the one. That's the one that I want. I'm going to go after the biggest one because it has the biggest numbers. Well, chances are your competition is going after that as well. And if they're more established than you, you're going to have a hard time outranking them. And so part of a, a strategy might be, I'm going to start by ranking for some of those smaller phrases because um, nobody's trying as hard to rank for them. And so if I can capture, you know, 1,700 to 3,000 people a month, that's a really great start. Obviously, it's a percentage of that, right? But that's a great start. And then once you get that one, maybe you can start optimizing for dairy-free milk. And then once you have momentum, you can go for some of those larger keywords. When you look at one of these spreadsheets, you may have thousands, or hundreds if not thousands of keywords to choose from. Some of them may only have 50 to 100 searches a month, but those are great when you're getting started because chances are most of the bigger players in your space don't really care about 50 to 100. Um, they're really optimizing for those bigger phrases. So if you can optimize for those to begin with, uh, that's gonna help you get some initial traction and momentum so that you can start ranking for those others. Um, and statistically, how that works out, let's say, for instance, that you choose something that only has 200 searches a month, uh, but you get a third of that traffic, you're getting 65 clicks. Alternatively, if you have something that's 1,000 a month, but you are number 20, and you're getting less than 1%, you're only getting four clicks. So this is a great visual representation of why we really want to qualify the, why we, the ones we choose based on how much competition there is for that phrase, and um, just being very strategic and mindful about how we write around these keywords when we're getting started. So what does this data look like? I've talked about it a lot, um, but this is one that I pulled for the project that I mentioned earlier where we were researching banana milk, and this is a mix of all kinds of different uh, sources. Now you will see there's one new statistic here, that's relevancy. Well, um, Moz, when they pull these details, one of the things that they do is they rank it on a scale of one to five with how relevant is it to your search. So banana milk is a five. It's super relevant, right? Um, banana milk, milkshake recipe, it also says is a five because it has those words in it. Um, when you get down to a one, it's things like, uh, is water vegan? which sadly does actually appear on this particular spreadsheet. Um, and it has about 10 searches a month, which is a little depressing, but um, how is it relevant? Well, you're talking about non-dairy drinks. Uh, is water vegan? I guess has some vague relevancy, so it would be included, but usually we just wanna look at things that have a relevancy score of three or higher. Um, because those are more likely to be the things that actually have to do with what we're looking at here. Uh, and that'll make a little bit more sense when you use this on your own project and really just start looking at the data. And that's true of any of the things that I'm going to show you guys today. But when we talk about data mining and when we talk about SEO, when we talk about Excel and 
like you can do this. We're looking at three columns of information at this point. It is not, it's not as overwhelming as a lot of people would like to make it out to be. There's a different way to pull the data. So this is uh, some information. You can pull this on any website. So you don't have to have access to the back end of a website to research it. Um, but at the time that we pulled this uh, information, you can also say what keywords is a website ranking for. So not just what are similar keywords, but what keywords are they already ranking for? And as you can see here, um, Wallow is ranking number one for a lot of things that had to do with their um, brand name, but well also with banana milk, um, things like that. So great for them, but you can also see some of those places where um, they're not as highly ranked. So here we have the rank in the US, the rank number one, and then as you go down, you can see they're either number two, three, or so on. This also introduces this idea of a difficulty score, which is on a scale of one to 100, how challenging is it to rank for this particular keyword based on other competition? Um, and the last thing you'll see on here is uh, which page is ranking for that particular phrase. So you'll see banana milk near me takes you to their store finder. That's the page. So it's not their whole website as a whole, but it's ranking for everything. Um, it actually comes down to particular pages on the website um, or more are more likely or not to come up as number one for that search phrase. Now, interesting thing here, I'm not quite sure where, why, but if you look at milk bear logo there, uh, roughly number 21, there's a minimum volume of zero, maximum volume of 10, but for some reason it's the most difficult thing to rank for on the page. Sometimes you'll run into things like that that are just kind of funny, um, but for context, that's, that's, you know, it's kind of amusing to me, but they do rank number six for it, so good for them. All right, another piece of data that's really helpful to have is uh, commonly asked questions from people in the community because that allows you to not only put the question on your website, but also put the answer, which at that point you have two pieces of content that Google likes. You have a question that matches what people are searching, but then you also have the relevant uh, answer there, which may earn you uh, a, a snippet, which um, is kind of the things that get featured at the top of the page. That's great if you can earn those. But how do we know what people are asking? Well, traditionally we did focus groups, we looked at things like that. However, there's just a filter on some of the data you can use. Again, this was pulled through Moz, where uh, I changed suggestion type for banana milk just to, to questions. That was it, just questions. And it told me the types of things that people are asking about banana milk, how to make banana juice, uh, what is in a banana, all these different kinds of things. Now, some of them, again, are going to be nonsense or unrelated. That's part of where you as a human have to start looking at the, the relevance and is that actually, um, you know, does that actually matter? I've been scrolling through and looking for some of those. And this is where learning Excel functions like pivot tables and VLOOKUP and things like that really do work to your advantage because otherwise you're manually sorting through, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of lines of data. And so Excel is a very important skill for anybody who's in communication going forward, um, not just for SEO. For it, it really is used in a lot of different contexts. But you can, in theory, do this piece of the research without those skills. It just is going to be a little bit more time consuming. All right, so we're gonna talk about this idea of link building. Um, there's a, uh, someone who works with Google who goes and does some Q and A's and he can say, he, he stated, they're, they're pretty, they hold things close to the chest and telling anybody how it works because that's their proprietary algorithms. Uh, but they do, they're pretty forward about content and links are two of the most important things. And that is the words on the page, uh, what is, what are you talking about, but also, who else is talking about you? Um, and so this is a fairly important piece of that puzzle is that um, are other people connected to your website for Google to be able to uh, reach that? So just a little bit of a technical piece, part of the way that Google um, reads websites, it doesn't read a website just because it exists. There's just too much content out there for it to uh, index everything just for the sake of existing. So what it does is it crawls websites. Um, they have these crawlers that more or less click on every link and see where it goes. 
Well, with that being said, the more links that you have to your website, the more opportunity Google has to add it to its index, its kind of catalog, um, and the more times that it's linked to, Google starts to learn that this is fairly relevant. Now, there's a little bit more that goes into it than that, and that's what we're gonna look at here, but know that links to your website are extremely important for ranking. All right, so first we're gonna just make sure we all are on the same page. What is a hyperlink? A hyperlink is a word or phrase or image that you can click on to jump to a new page. So uh, I've pointed at one there, we've all clicked on them. Um, that is a, a hyperlink. You just, if you're wanting to do that, you just highlight the phrase and there's like a little link button typically that'll allow you to embed a uh, website URL in there. Um, this is fairly basic stuff, but I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page there. Um, now, I do want to kind of teach you one vocabulary word here, where you see the beginner's guide to SEO there. Um, that's what we refer to as anchor text. And so anchor text is the phrase that refers to which, which little words are blue, which little words do you click on? Um, because those things can uh, also help uh, Google understand what that link is about. All right, so link building as a practice. Uh, it's the process of acquiring hyperlinks from other websites on your own. There are many techniques for building links, and while they vary in difficulty, SEOs tend to agree that link building is one of the hardest parts of their job. Um, and I, I, my opinion on that is that I think that SEOs typically don't love doing link building because most SEOs come from more of a web development background. Um, and so when you're doing web development, it's a lot about looking at the infrastructure of a website or looking at the more interesting IT pieces. Most people who get into web development don't do so because they love like pitching stories or talking to people or the sales component of um, things. And I think those things are why communicators are very well qualified to do link building because it's basically digital PR. Um, it's not necessarily branded as such, but there are a lot of overlaps. And we're gonna kind of look at this here because um, you can have a huge impact on a page's SEO just by being a little bit more intentional with how we do some of our outreach efforts. So link building is the process of acquiring links from other websites to your own. Links often work as like an endorsement so generally user generated content sites like Facebook, Wikipedia, or forums, um, they have links, but they're no follow links. And what that means is that I, as a human, can click on that link and go to the page, but Google and those crawlers that I mentioned, um, it's going to look at the code of that website and say, okay, this website's not endorsing, I'm not going to index this link. So I, as a human, can click it and go on the site, Google doesn't recognize it as um, kind of providing that, that, uh, that endorsement from their page. Um, so anyway, that there's, there's a phrase called domain authority that we're going to look at and that has to, that impacts that. So domain authority, uh, is a rank factor developed by Moz. Um, there's, there's page rankings. There's, everybody has some version of this, but for simplicity, we're going to talk about domain authority. It's a search engine ranking that predicts how well a website will rank on search engine result page. It scores sites on a scale of one to 100 and is based on the domain authority of the sites that link to your page. Um, now that is logarithmic, so uh, it's easier to get from one to 10 than it is to get from 90 to 100. Uh, very few sites have um, 90 and above, and most of those are big international brands and companies um, and things like that. But uh, if your you know, neighbor's kid has a blog and they link to you, chances are that they don't have a very high authority that's not gonna have as much impact on the SEO of your website as um, you know, a local business or even a local news outlet. Um, the higher domain authority you have, the more impactful your outbound links are. And so if you have a website yourself, uh, maybe it's a blog with a bunch of other people writing articles, things like that. Um, the higher your authority score, the more that your links um, power other websites. 
Uh, and so authority score, it's kind of an, uh, a link economy of sorts where you're providing a vote to another website on Google about its value, but not all votes are created equal. Larger websites with more authority have kind of a, a more significant vote in the process. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. We're getting into a little bit of the technical stuff that I don't want to track down too much. Just know, bigger the website, better the value uh, from SEO perspective. I will give you guys uh, a case study of this, kind of a sad one, but um, in 2012, um, I was uh, working with a children's theater uh, in Arlington, maybe it was 2014 at that point. Um, and if you were to look up Children's Theater Arlington, we ranked probably number four or five. Uh, there was uh, there's a place called Theater Arlington that also offers children classes. There's in Arlington, Texas and in Arlington, Virginia. And so our website was number four or five if you were to search the phrase Children's Theater Arlington. Well, unfortunately we had a fire and um, that was, it was, uh, it was, really <laughs> stressful uh there was uh, uh but lots of news coverage came out of that and so um you know the firefighters were there there was a number of different news stories all of which linked back to the website if someone wanted to learn more to make a donation things like that you can see at the bottom those blue words that anchor text there links back to the website um, and within a few days, then we ranked number one for Children's Theater Arlington. So there was kind of a silver lining almost, but, um, uh, you know, that, that's, um, that's just a, a, an example of how getting some of those links can help increase the rankings um, of a particular search phrase. So what does the data look like? Again, we're starting to get more in depth with the data, but I don't want anybody to get overwhelmed because we're still looking at a lot of the same types of stuff. Here, uh, I, in this tool, in link research, you're able to um, find the different links that are connecting to a page and see where they're getting a lot of their authority. So for Moala, for instance, which we've been talking about throughout, um, it tells me here on the left, what's the URL? So Forbes, Business Insider, uh, Hang of the Wire, these are all different websites that have written about them. It says, what's the title of the article? Um, pretty straightforward. What's the anchor text? We've already talked about that. Now you'll notice that a lot of the time the anchor text is just the brand's name, and that's fine. Um, but sometimes you'll see it's banana milk, and that's has kind of additional useful value in teaching um, Google what our page is about. Spam score, we're not gonna really get into here. Uh, we have page authority and domain authority. So domain authority is mostly what we are gonna look at and discuss for the context of this lecture, but that is overall for the whole website, what's its score, what's its authority, what's its power to, uh, you know, estimated power. Well, it gets that uh, authority from the individual pages on there. So some pages, um, like, you know, your home page probably has more traffic and more links than your FAQ page. And so um, that's what page authority has to do is, is, you know, where does that overall domain authority come from on those individual pages? Again, probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, it has target URL, which page on our website is it going to? Uh, are they follow links? So yes, as we talked about, we're only looking at links when I sorted this data that um, are crawled by Google. And when they were first seen and how many other people linked to that page. Now this type of uh, data is super useful. And I know people in the PR field who, um, you know, and maybe they've done it or maybe they've had interns do it where they were like, you know, Google this phrase and look at the first 10 pages of Google and find out every time we've been mentioned so that we can pull that into a report for, our client. Well, this does that same thing that you can just kind of sort by when the link appeared. Um, and this is a really easy way to track a lot of your online brand mentions. So even if you have no interest in SEO, these tools are very useful for PR practitioners um, to be able to uh, research and identify some of their own, um, their own impact. 
Now, another place that is really useful, again, this is more for PR, uh, but you can research the links of your competitors. This is not private information. Um, this is all of the things that these different tools can pull. And sometimes this becomes like a shopping list of places to potentially pitch a story. Because and now you have to read through it. Like if you read that TechCrunch article, um, it's more about the economy. It's not really about non-dairy alternatives. So I probably wouldn't pitch a story there to them based on that. But treehugger.com, for instance, I might be able to go and read then say, you know what, this is the type of website that's going to care about the type of story that I have. Uh, let me pitch a story to them. Now, there are all kinds of different tools that make this even more intuitive. Uh, Moz has what they call link inter intersect tool. I think Ahrefs and, and most of them have some variation of it um, where you can put in two competitor websites and it will tell you all the different websites that have written about both of them. Um, well, that's a really easy way to kind of narrow the field and a good uh, way to kind of start with a list. So. Anyway, this is a great research tool, even if you don't care about SEO at all, um, from a professional perspective, this is great information to be able to pull. All right, final thoughts, PR is SEO. Now SEO is a very complex process when it comes down to a lot of the website things about how quickly does your website load and uh, is it mobile friendly? These are all things that you very, very, very much need an SEO professional to um, take care of those pieces. But I do want us to understand that people in advertising and PR and communications in general do impact SEO whether they know it or not. So what I encourage you to do is learn the tools so that you can quantify the impact of what you're doing. I'm, I can't tell you how many times somebody's uh, said, well, we handed out 3,000 brochures. And it's like, well, that's that's wonderful, you know, that's great, but um, how do you quantify the return on investment for that? Well, you can get kind of creative sometimes, but if you can understand these research tools, um, they are a huge asset to be able to quantify uh, what you're doing. So there's a few things here. Uh, PR and SEO can absolutely be friends. I think that probably in the next five years, we're gonna see a lot more overlap of um, people who are in SEO, uh, learning more of these, uh, creating more content that is um, relevant to consumers. I think you're going to see PR agencies start leveraging these tools. Um, and I think one of the huge factors is going to be uh, the students coming out of college right now. I mean, I can tell you that um, I teach at TCU and we have students in strategic communication who are graduating right now uh, as PR and advertising students who have a data analytics minor, which they graduate Excel certified and knowing how to program in Python, right? Well, those are not skills that your traditional PR practitioners have. And so I think that there's actually gonna be a lot of leading that comes from this uh, younger generation. I think they have a lot to learn, don't get me wrong, uh, but I think that they are gonna bring new skills to the table that really help bridge the gap in this information. Um, but other ways that PR um, and SEO can be friends, a lot of our uh, press sites that we send to, they, they only want 400 to 500 words in a press release for a newswire, um, which isn't a lot, it's not a ton. And uh, part of that's because um, journalists just don't have as much time uh, to churn and burn stuff. The, some of that has to do with just the amount of content. But sometimes you have more than 400 words that you wanna say. Well, you can write those long form press releases and publish them as, keyword rich content on your website. Maybe you have a press area, maybe it's just on a blog. And maybe that shorter uh, press release that you put out on the newswire links back to the full version so they can learn more. This is a way that you can get a lot of, that PR can write content for the site that's very much for PR, but also helps people find the website. News coverage often produces high authority, do follow inbound links. We talked about that a little bit ago where we were talking about those um, different news sites that wrote about the, the incident there. Um, but the other thing to kind of note is that for context, I, I was talking about domain authority and getting them higher. Most news outlets have pretty decent authority because a lot of people are visiting, they're getting a lot of traffic, people are spending time on them, they're getting linked to a lot. 
Um, for context, um, Bluehost is an international web hosting company, arguably one of the largest web hosting companies in the world. So it's a very large industry, very large international company, and they have a domain authority that is equal to the Dallas Morning News. So getting a link from the Dallas Morning News may carry as much authority as getting a link from one of the largest web host providers in the world. Now, I, so that's an important thing to think about. You can do a lot with PR to help get those high authority links um, when, when you can. Even without a hyperlink, if there's just a news story written about your brand, unlinked brand mentions are still indexed by Google. Now, it's not as much of, it doesn't carry as much weight, it's not as authoritative, but Google is getting smarter and just kind of identifying what people are talking about. And if your brand is mentioned in the context of a conversation, um, it does take that into account. Website traffic is a ranking factor. Uh, it's so important that I listed it there five, twice, traffic, traffic. <laughs> so website traffic is a ranking factor. So if you have a press release and even it creates a news story on the television, which doesn't get a link back to you, but people start looking for it and start visiting your website more, great. You have actually impacted the SEO of that website by increasing the amount of traffic there. Um, and uh, time on page is another ranking factor. And if people kind of learn about, like if I accidentally click on a link and I see, eh, this isn't really interesting and I just leave, that doesn't, that's actually can be penalized to the website because it's telling Google, people don't care about this content. They're just bouncing. But if I see something even on TV again and I search it, I'm interested, I wanna learn more. And so that viewer, that user, even if they don't buy anything, if they go to your website and just go to several different pages and spend some time on it, that has some value in helping build your credibility with those search engines. So PR and SEO, uh, are very connected. They're not always, uh, they don't always work in tandem, particularly for, you know, different structures of companies, but I think that we'll see more of that in the future. All right, this is a lot of information, I admit, and some of it's fairly technical. We covered a broad scope of a very large and trending and evolving piece of um, the marketing world in however much time this just took. I am glad to answer any questions for you guys. If you want to write out to me or just comment on this video, um, or you can email me, uh, I would love to answer any questions that you have about this. Again, this is a rudimentary, elementary introduction to search engine optimization and how it can be impactful for us as communicators, particularly for people who are learning and um, entering the job market. I guarantee you this is not the last time that you're going to hear somebody talk about uh, SEO in the context of what you're doing. So reach out. I'm here to be a resource and I hope you guys have a great afternoon.